thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, and thank you to Professor Kleinberg for the invitation and to Yael Levy for her very patient uh, and thoughtful organization of my visit. Um, it's really special for me to be here. Um, uh, but uh, I was very good exactly 30 years ago when I left. Uh, I was fluent back then and now not so much. Uh, what I'm presenting to you today is a work in progress. So that is your, um, your caveat. Uh, it's a snapshot of where I am right now with some of the material. And I very, very much welcome discussion, criticism, tough questions, um, uh, effusive compliments, whatever you have at the end of the, of the lecture. <laughs> Charisma is an awful lot like obscenity. It is hard to define, but we know it when we see it. Or at least we tend to think we do. In practice, people disagree on which individuals are charismatic, whether their charismatic appeal is artificial or innate, whether their magnetism can only be felt in person or can survive being recorded and broadcast, and whether that strange, ineffable power is a force for good or evil. The topic becomes even more complicated when we add gender to the mix. While we have theories of charisma that attempt to describe the aura of politically powerful men, our notions of what female charisma might look like tend to come from the world of celebrity. For one thing, it can be hard to differentiate between charisma, and we might also call it star power, aura, the it factor, and mere sex appeal. Feminine charisma in the 20th century has also largely been shaped by what I would call the tradition of the tragic diva, with its notion that a beautiful woman becomes all the more enchanting when she suffers intensely, or dies young, or both. When charismatic women are imagined either as saints or as sirens, sirens it is hard to connect them to the idea of power as well. This is uh, a slide that just gives you the sense of how difficult it sometimes is uh, for people in the media to come up with images. I can move to the side, if not everyone can see. Uh, with images that communicate uh, a woman in power. And I have many more of these. Um, in my talk today, I hope to tease out some of these issues around the notion of charisma, especially when it is applied to the past. I will begin by giving a very brief rather superficial history of the term, touching on some of the ways it has been used in medieval studies in particular. After discussing my own approach to charisma, as it stands right now, I will take you through a brisk trot of medieval examples, one of them historical, broadly speaking, and the other ones literary. So there will also be some plot summary there. If you know the works already, I apologize in advance, you'll be bored, but I assume nobody would know every single work. I hope to show a series of charismatic strategies I have identified in texts, and in doing so to invite a broader conversation about how to approach charisma in the past. The Greek term charisma was used by the Apostle Paul to refer to spiritual gifts granted by God to members of a community. And it maintained its restricted meaning of gift or grace of God until the 20th century. Tertullian, Prudentius, Odo of Cluny, and St. Bonaventure all use it in this sense. The sociologist Max Weber, as many will probably know, adapted it to refer to a type of leadership, calling it a quality of an individual personality by virtue of which he is considered extraordinary <coughs> and treated as endowed with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. Now Weber, uh, Weber based his definition of charisma exclusively on male leaders, and more importantly, considered charisma to be a quality dependent on success. The hero who cannot protect his people or deliver military victories loses his charisma. That's how Weber thought of it. Interestingly, while St. Paul's charisma was a gift from above, from the Holy Spirit, Weber's charisma was a gift from below. A person's followers could ascribe charisma to him and also take it away. I think this is really important. I think this is an insight that's very useful from Weber, even for other kinds of charisma. 
While Weber's expansion of the term's range made it adaptable to other areas of human endeavor, such as commerce or theater, at its core, it is a concept defined with male leaders in mind. Scholars describing charisma in late antiquity and in the Middle Ages have maintained Weber's focus on strength. In his influential discussion of late antique saints, Peter Brown defines charisma as the convincing concentration in an event, in an institution, in a discipline, or in a person of lingering senses of order and higher purpose. Stephen Jaeger, who has devoted two monographs to charismatic manifestations in the Middle Ages, also understands it as an essentially positive quality, a kind of force and authority exercised by people with an extraordinary personal presence, either given by nature, acquired by calculation, training, or merit. Charisma, so says Jaeger, is always seen as benevolent and life-affirming, at least until disenchantment sets in. And Jaeger's focus has been like Brown's on positively construed power. Now, one way to define charisma is as the embodiment of higher powers of purpose. But a different approach, one which I find more interesting, is to describe the effect charisma or a charismatic person has on observers. John Potts, who wrote a book uh, about the history of charisma, notes that Paul adapted the term from the Greek charis, a word whose meanings range from outward grace or favor, beauty, to kindness and goodwill, and gratification, delight. Modern uses of the word charisma have tended to keep in mind that charisma exists in the eye of the beholder. Charles Lindholm sees it as a compulsive, inexplicable emotional tie, linking a group of followers together in adulation of their leader, or tying the lover to the beloved. While Jaeger explains that charismatic people have varying effects on others, um, starting with an evanescent buzz and a brief affection, moving through love, passionate devotion, elevation and transformation, and reaching destructive obsession. By thinking of charisma as the ability to elicit powerful emotions in others, and even to move others to action, we can expand the qualities we think of as charismatic. A charismatic individual may be strong and successful, and thus inspire others to follow and obey, but he or she may also fascinate by provoking strong emotional reactions in viewers which I propose can be both positive and negative. I mean that the reactions, this is sort of where I'm going a little bit with this, um, that we don't just need to look for positive reactions in the audience, the spectators, the perceivers, whoever they might be, the commenters, um, that often quite negative reactions will also be a sign of a kind of charismatic effect. As this brief sur survey suggests, uh, the concept of charisma has developed quite a bit since Max Weber's use of it. Uh, today it is used broadly to describe a skill that businessmen try to learn from specialized courses and books. If you look up charisma on amazon.com, you find <laughs> 30 books on be charismatic with three simple tricks. Uh, the appeal of movie stars, musicians, and other celebrities, and even for species of animals that are particularly cute uh, and thus useful for conservation efforts. Those are charismatic animals, um, are the ones you want to build uh, <laughs> an ad campaign around. Um, seals, you know. Uh, given the evolution of the term, it is impossible to define one single type of charisma. There are different kinds of charisma, and they come about in different ways. Some people have a natural ability to connect with and attract other people. Some have charisma crafted for them by an institution such as the Hollywood star system. And other individuals acquire a charismatic aura due to the roles they occupy. Positions like king, pope, university professor. Rather than trying for a single definition of the term, it is more productive to think about what range of emotional and aesthetic effects the notion of charisma encompasses, and what kinds of strategies of representation are involved in bringing it about. One very useful critic for this kind of analysis is the theater scholar Joseph Roach. Um, and Joe is my teacher, so you can still criticize him, but I'm, I'm very much following in his quite charismatic footsteps here. 
In his book, It, a study of stardom ranging from the 18th to the 20th century, Roach describes the fascination of celebrities by recalling the auras of medieval kings <coughs> and saints. As their sacred images circulate in the vortex of the profane imagination, these double-bodied persons foreground a peculiar combination of contradictory attributes expressed through outward signs of the union of their imperishable and mortal bodies. These include the simultaneous appearance of strength and vulnerability in the same performance, even in the same gesture. Let those marks of strength be called charismata, the signs of vulnerability stigmata. They work cooperatively, like muscles in opposable pairs, and their mesmerizing interplay has a long history as well as popular currency as the source of public intimacy. Roach remarks that Achilles was a more compelling hero because of his heel, not in spite of it, thus highlighting an aspect of charisma which is often ignored in strongman models. Those models tend to associate charisma with success, positive superhuman qualities, um, and muscular masculine leadership. And by definition, they tend to include, exclude female figures. And I think not only because women are less often in positions of political or military power, especially historically. Prominent women, be they historical or fictional, tend to draw complex positive and negative reactions, making it harder to fit them into this mold of superhuman positive charisma. Roach's discussion of the effects achieved by attention of opposite qualities can be true, I think, of male and female figures, but it's a particularly useful configuration for thinking about representations of women. In my own research, I locate charisma at the nexus of power, fascination, fame, enchantment, and emulation. You'll notice that I'm not offering a kind of two, one or two sentence definition, uh, partly because I'm not there yet, but partly because I think it's, it's more useful to think about it as a constellation of qualities. Uh, not necessarily always sharing in all of them. Charisma is often close to power, though it is not always active political power. It often results in fame. It elicits fascination, the desire to know, possess, or even destroy the charismatic person. It does so through means that can seem magical or otherworldly. And it frequently stimulates copying of the charismatic person's gestures, habits, language, or style of dress. Moreover, as I said, it would be best, most accurate to say there isn't one kind of charisma, but a series of overlapping types of charisma that share in the common traits that I just mentioned. Now, in looking for charisma in the past, I'm not actually engaged in arguing that particular historical figures were charismatic. Um, as much as that they were represented as being so. I think it's very difficult to, to distinguish between that kind of magnetic personal presence and a, a, convincing, um, a convincing representation of it. Certainly some people like Joan of Arc must have been. I mean, it just doesn't make sense that she had the career she did without having been personally charismatic. But for this project, I'm being a little more uh, careful and looking at the ways people are represented or represent themselves as being that way. And I'm looking at the strategies they use. Um, and my main body of work is English and French medieval literature, so mostly imaginative literature. But I also look, partly because I think they're just such uh, interesting examples, in some texts which are perhaps a little more biographical, um, like the writings of Eloise uh, Vargenteuil or Marjorie Kemp, um, without necessarily assuming that they were successful in representing themselves in charismatic, as charismatic. So I'm just saying, they tried. Um, and I want to point out a few key strategies um, that I've noted uh, that apply to a vast range of people one might call charismatic, male or female. First, as Roach suggested in the quote I mentioned earlier, fascination arises from the presentation of two vastly different bodies in one person. And one might think of the king's two bodies, a god who is also a man, or a mother who remains a virgin. Second, charismatic people often combine opposing qualities, vulnerability and strength, masculinity and femininity, innocence and experience. 
Charismatic performances, I've noticed, often play on the contrast between interiority and exteriority. Mask and face, skin and bloody flesh, alternating them to provoke curiosity or create the illusion of intimacy. And some of the texts I look at have very strange effects there, where it's often difficult to grasp what is inside and what is outside. They start to flip in odd ways. Charisma is created often through the adoption of archetypes, such as the Amazon, the sinner, or the lamenting woman. And it is also assumed by stepping into the footsteps of an absent charismatic person. The martyr saints imitated Christ. Marjorie, of Kemp, Marjorie Kemp modeled herself on St. Bridget. Madonna dressed like Marilyn Monroe. And Bill Clinton um, presented himself as a new JFK. I think I actually have a good slide here. Um, Finally, charisma also works through objects which either carry the charm of their previous owner or provide a locus of desire and imitation. These are like the relics of saints or brands associated with stars. And they can uh, include props, accessories, clothes, and hair. So you see the, the effect. It's often one that's done quite consciously. Working with the modern term to elucidate the past carries certain methodological pitfalls, of course, even as it offers an opportunity to think about the dynamics of power, fascination, and gender in intertwined ways. And I'd like at this point uh, just to introduce some of the questions I'm asking as I go through this project. Um, some of them aim at breaking down the topic of charisma into con its constituent parts. Um, so it's to start to get around to, uh, to how charisma looks in texts, rather than trying to search for the thing itself to break down the different elements of it, how it, um, the kind of language used to describe it or its effects. So one thing I'm asking is what kinds of words, images, or objects uh, are typically associated with charismatic people or characters in medieval sources. These are often celestial bodies, certain animals, types of movement or speech, hair and clothing in particular configurations. I'm uh, looking at whether there are particular terms uh, in medieval texts that might be a, a kind of contemporary uh, version of the word charisma. I'm asking what kinds of emotions charismatic people evoke um, in either represented or historical characters and in the audience of a text or work of art, which is to say, I think sometimes when there's a long tradition around a certain figure, I'm taking that as a clue that there's something, a kind of charismatic effect, Mary Magdalene, for example, uh, that keeps people wanting to return to that figure and tell the story over and over again. I'm interested in what the gendered aspects of charisma are and whether are there are particular configurations of charisma that um, are associated with masculine, feminine, or queer identities. And I'm also interested in whether it's tied to or transcends class. It's often easier to find charismatic descriptions for high class uh, characters. I want to know what kinds of power charisma allows women um, and whether considering feminine charisma specifically changes the way we might think about the charisma of sovereigns. And I'm interested, in, and this is because I'm in a large comparative project at Bonn, in what we can learn about charisma from transcultural comparisons. Um, does it look similar in different cultures in terms of the symbols and the kinds of images associated with it, or will it be different in the different uh, situations? And then finally, I ask what the relationship of charisma is to fictionality, to performance, and what kind of deliberate strategies an artist can use to depict someone as charismatic. So that's the introduction. I'm going to now go rather quickly through a series of exam example texts and show you how I see some of these questions working out in different situations. But first, I will pour myself some more water. So I think a great place to begin the study of charisma is by examining one half of the world's um, most charismatic couples of all history, Eloise and Abelard. 
I think each member of this pair quite consciously crafted a charismatic persona. But for today, I'll focus on Abelard for the simple reason that I'm not sure he was successful. I think he tried very hard, but I'm not sure he was successful. But he gives a really nice case study for, some, for what it looks like when someone tries very hard to come across as charismatic. Some of the strategies he uses that I want to underscore are insisting on his own fame and reputation. This is kind of a sort of, I'm, I'm going to be famous because I keep saying I am, right? It's a little bit of the Jay-Z uh, approach to charisma. Um, presenting himself as a new version of charismatic historical, historical figures in quite deliberate ways. And recasting the opprobrium of others as a sign of his own specialness. Um, so people who hate me are just further proof of my extraordinary nature, right? It's very by the book in a sense. I think not everyone knows who Abelard is. The, the introduction is coming. <laughs> Abelard's life, uh, as some of you know, is dramatic by any standard. He was a little too aware of his own cleverness, and he came into conflict with established theologians such as Anselm of Laon and William of Champeaux as he pursued an ambitious and peripatetic uh, academic career. Having finally become the master of the cathedral school at Notre Dame of Paris in uh, 1113, Abelard conspired to be taken into the house of Heloise's uncle, Fulbert. He then tutored, seduced, and impregnated Heloise, married her secretly, and when he temporarily sent her off to a convent, her relatives assumed that he was trying to get rid of the problem, that he was trying to put her away uh, permanently. So inventions, they arranged for him to be attacked in his sleep and castrated. Now a eunuch, Abelard compelled Heloise to take the veil in earnest and then began life as a monk himself at the Abbey of Saint-Denis, sometime around 1117, 1118. And these were not the last of his tribulations. In 1121, Abelard's theologia was condemned at the Council of Soissons he was forced to burn his own book, which was a great emotional blow to him. One gets the sense it was almost as bad as the castration. In 1122, uh, he'd had some questions about the identity of uh, Saint-Denis and Dionysus. It led to a scandal since the abbey he was at was named after that saint. Um, and he had to leave and founded an oratory de dedicated to the paraclete or Holy Spirit. Uh, Heloise was at this time also going through rough situations with her nuns um, and she moved into, with her nuns, with her community into, that, um, into the paraclete. And she was to spend the rest of her time there. She was actually then a very successful as an abbess. She had a great career. She did really well even though it wasn't the job she had particularly chosen for herself. But Abelard's troubles continued and they peaked in 1141 when he was condemned for heresy and sentenced to perpetual silence and he died a year later. So we get these, um, the story or much of the story of his life um, through the Historia Calamitatum, um, sometimes translated as the story of my calamities, um, which is written to a friend. Uh, and it's, it's an over the top, very rhetorical form of life writing. Um, he's confessing to how terrible he was, but also wants to let you know how wonderful he was at the same time. Now, whether or not he was personally charismatic, he was deeply invested in, cast, in crafting a charismatic persona, uh, both for himself and then later he has an exchange of letters with Heloise in which he continues uh, this. The nature of it changes, however. So in his earlier years, he presents himself as an attractive teacher and poet. Students try to learn from him, abandoning other masters to follow the more successful and dynamic Abelard. Women in Paris hear his songs and long to be his lovers. This is actually a detail from one of Heloise's letters. Castration and the associated public humiliation put an end to his sexual life and to his career as a Parisian teacher, but also to his image. And so I think what he's doing in, um, in the work is that he has to essentially craft a new identity for himself. He's not really willing to let go of the idea of being charismatic, but he has to figure out a new way of being charismatic. He's obsessed with fame, with his fame and influence, but what he does to 
keep this in the new identity he has now in the church, um, or rather monastic life, is by drawing on a series uh, of idealized charismatic teachers, um, ancient philosophers, the apostles, and especially late antique desert fathers, and comparing himself to them in a way to rebuild his charismatic identity. So his, the Historia Calamitatum, I'm only going to give you a few examples just to show how absolutely obsessed he was uh, with his own fame and with his effect on others. He's repeatedly coming back to the idea of how, um, how admired he was for his philosophical output, for his poetry, for his pedagogical superiority. Um, and he claims that many of his misfortunes arose from his prominence. As my fame spread more widely, the envy of others were, was aroused against me, he writes. When he becomes master of his own school, this only gets worse. From the time when I established my school, my fame as a dialectician began to increase so much that the reputation not only of my fellow students, but of our teacher himself, gradually diminished and was finally eclipsed. Um, he later goes on to challenge Anselm of Laon, whose anger, again, only makes him better known. The more evident his jealousy became, the more it redounded to my honor, and his persecution only made me more famous. And then he becomes famous, renowned in Paris, teaching philosophy and scripture. Because of the interest in both fields, my classes grew by leaps and bounds, and you cannot have failed to hear how much money and fame they brought me. This is a small selection, right? The picture one has when reading this book is of a man fixated upon his past fame and by the desire and envy it provoked in others. Even his love for Heloise, in his telling of it, is grounded in her renown. He seems to be attracted to her primarily because of her fame, with the sense that it would be fitting for two such peerless and applauded individuals to unite. She was by no means the least handsome of women, but in the extent of her learning, she surpassed them all. Since this gift is so rare in women, it won the highest praise for her and made her the most famous woman in the whole kingdom. Seeing in her all of the qualities that commonly attract admirers, I decided that she was the right person to unite with myself in love, and I felt this would be easy to do. For I was then so renowned and so outstanding in my youth and charm that I was not afraid of being rejected by any woman whom I should deign to love. And he sees, I find this, uh, other than the fact that it's a hilarious passage, I find it so telling because he seems more enchanted by Heloise's appeal to others than by any possible interest she could hold to him. The relationship naturally serves to produce more fame, and Abelard notes that the songs he composed about it are still recited in many places, right? So it's already becoming legendary in its own time. It should be no surprise then that when he describes his castration, you would think he would be most upset about the castration. But in fact, repeatedly it seems that the worst part of it is the damage to his reputation and to his fame rather than to his body. When morning came, this is the day after being castrated, the whole city thronged around me, and I can hardly tell you how stunned they were, how loudly they mourned, how they tormented me with their clamor and upset me with their laments. It was chiefly the students, and particularly my own pupils, who tortured me with unbearable moaning and wailing, so that I suffered more from their pity than from the aching of my wound. I felt the embarrassment more than the injury, and my shame made me more wretched than my pain. I thought of the great fame in which I had once gloried, and how swiftly and sordidly my pride had been humbled, or rather destroyed. And you see the scene as a kind of dark inversion of his previous glory in the world as a teacher. And the responses, the quite natural effective responses of his students only served to hurt him more. Uh, it's really the highly public nature of his shame that hurts him. I knew also how widely this unparalleled disgrace would be broadcast for all the world to know. 
What course would be open to me in the future? How could I show my face in public to be pointed at by everyone, to have my name on every tongue, to be a monstrous spectacle to the eye? I think these passages really serve to show the nature of Abelard's trauma. He's mourning the loss of his identity, not simply as self-definition or even as a social role, but as a presence in the public. So what does he do? He draws on the collective cultural memory of three groups of charismatic figures. I mentioned this earlier, ancient philosophers, the apostles, late antique ascetics, to craft a new self. And he's constantly reshaping the meaning of his tribulations by casting himself as the follower of these groups of people. Um, so another, I love these long quotes from Abelard because they're so emotional and you really get the sense of what, uh, what itches at him. Uh, the Council of Soissons, where he's forced to burn his own book. This is, uh, he has a, endures a kind of second trauma to his reputation. O oh God who judges equity, with what gall of soul, what bitterness of spirit did I in my madness challenge you and furiously accuse you, repeating again and again the lament of St. Anthony, good Jesus, where were you? Yet although I felt then, I cannot now express the great sorrow that surged up in me, the bitter shame that confounded me, the deep despair that attacked me. I compared what I was now suffering with those bodily wounds I had endured earlier, and I thought that I was the most wretched of men. I considered that earlier betrayal slight in comparison with this, and I mourned far more over the damage to my reputation than over the injury to my body. So we see this again as it was true for the, the day after his castration. The rep, his reputation is the main locus of trauma. However, he's citing St. Anthony, and I think this deliberate citation suggests how he's beginning to frame his suffering and despair as an imitation of ascetic saints. By the end of the Historia Calamitatum, he winds up describing himself as Jerome, uh, the church father Jerome's heir in the abuses of slander, which is a comparison meant to improve Abelard's stature. He may be ill-treated like Jerome, but he's still Jerome's heir. So despite acknowledging that his downfall came partly from his own pride, Abelard subsequently describes himself as enjoying just as much fame as a monastic teacher as he did as a philosopher. And he goes on about how uh, hordes of students flocked to, I won't read this one out loud, hordes of students flocked to his cell. He was just as talented as a, as a, as a religious teacher as he had been as a secular one. Um, but at this point, his professorial charisma is pretty much the same as it was in Paris when he was a, a proper teacher. It's really at the point when he builds an oratory on donated land near Troyes that he starts to very explicitly follow in the footsteps of ancient ascetics. And this is a really key passage that's quite often quoted. Um, he talks about building the oratory, hidden away with one of his students. When my former pupils learned where I was, they began to flock together here from every direction leaving the cities and towns to live in this desert place. Instead of large houses, they built themselves little huts. Uh, they ate wild herbs and coarse bread instead of dainty foods. They laid down thatch and straw for themselves instead of soft beds and piled up heaps of turfs, turf for tables. You really would have thought that they were imitating the early philosophers of whom Jerome writes in his second book against Jovinian. So I think here he's really starting to shift into this new charismatic persona. Um, he's building the paraclete in the countryside. This is the wilderness that late antique hagiography understands as being the opposition to the sinful city. And he's establishing a new kind of charismatic authority, um, one that's based explicitly in the recollected models of philosophers, prophets, and monks. Uh, he's Students are no longer simply eager for learning, but they're coming to embrace the entire ascetic experience around him. It's, sort of, it's a transformation from scholar to hermit. Um, and you would think that this would, be, would come along with a kind of spiritual change for Abelard, that he would um, move from the external life to the inner life, from the appreciation of the public to the approval of God. And, but no, this is still Abelard. He's still obsessed with reputation and fame. 
Um, and on the way that his success with students is a humiliation for his enemies. They complained and lamented this as the enemies, secretly among themselves, saying, look, the whole world has turned aside to follow him. We have accomplished nothing but pers by persecuting him, but to make him more famous. We have tried to extinguish his renown, but instead we have made it more brilliant. It is obvious that in the cities, students have everything they need at hand, and yet reject all civilized pleasures to rush to the wilderness with all its deprivations and willingly make themselves miserable. So I think, um, I'm going to sum up a page a bit quickly. I think what's so interesting is that on the one hand, this is a very typical trope, right? Going into the wilderness for the ascetic life. Um, Abelard is certainly not the only person in medieval culture to pick this as a model in an explicit and thoughtful way. And if you look at um, Athanasius's life of Anthony or Jerome's life of Paul of Thebes, you also have this motif of disciples coming and pestering the ascetic, right? It's always a little bit of a problem uh, that people want to come and learn from you. Um, but the difference is that in those, uh, in those narratives, the ascetic is generally humble, right? <laughs> Well, at least th this is the fiction, right? You have to kind of turn them away. Uh, and then the hagiographer maybe breaks the rule or the students peek, peek in. But you're not supposed to be trying to, um, to, to court that kind of admiration. Abelard, even when he's really consciously modeling himself in, um, in, in the, in the, against, against these ascetics, uh, is still insisting on his renown. He's still insisting on his fame. Uh, he's enchanted by the paradox of his new charismatic power and really by his ability to become even more famous when he's out of sight. So now I have a few examples from Mid Middle English literature. These will be quicker. And they're going to show you um, a few variations on the kinds of themes I've been talking about today. So the, my first one is from uh, Geoffrey Chaucer's The Legend of Good Women. Uh, this is a work of the 1380s. And it's really a playful, ironic dream vision, um, which begins with, uh, so <coughs> Chaucer often has these, uh, these poet narrators who are based on him. They're lightly fictionalized versions of himself. And the poem begins with the god of love, Cupid, accusing him of having written poetry uh, that gave a bad name to women, right? Representing, betraying uh, traitorous women like crusade and essentially making life difficult for women. And as penance, the narrator has to compose a series of lives or poems about legendary women. Um, he does this quite uh, interestingly. So first of all, he, they're legendary women from classic from classical culture. They're not, um, they're not saintly women. And he, he establishes a tension in, in a lot of the, the profiles between strength and vulnerability displayed by these heroines. I think this tension is a very typical charismatic strategy. The word legend in the poem's title is also not accidental. He's playing off of the idea of a collection of saints' lives. Also, of course, individuals who are most powerful at the moment of their destruction except his women include not so saintly women such as Cleopatra and Medea. Medea, uh, conveniently, he, met, he leaves out the child killing aspect of her vita because he's only supposed to say good things about women in this poetic work. I think this is an interesting text because it's quite often, the question I've gotten when I presented material uh, from this project is, what's the difference between a woman's charisma and her sexual appeal? Right? Aren't I ta actually just talking about sexual appeal a lot of the time, or about the male gaze, what have you? But I think what Chaucer is interested in is actually something more like charisma than just erotic appeal. The women of his collection suffer attractively, that's definitely true, but they do more than complain. And in fact, he often presents them as powerful, either because they exercise political power in quite obvious ways, or because they're clever and scheming and strategic. They often save the men. Um, they they're often show different kinds of agency. 
So I give you one example from this text. It's his portrait of Dido, uh, which I think illustrates a particularly feminine form of charismatic leadership. I'll read just a little of the Middle English because I think it's nice to have a little Middle English and then I'll do the translation and mostly I'll read translations. This noble queen that clipped was Dido, that whilom was the weef of Sideo, that fared was than is the brichte son, this noble tune of Carthage hath begun, in which she regneth in so great honor that she was holden of all queenes flour of gentiles, of freedom, of beauté, that well was him that michte her honest say, of kinges and of lordes so desired that all the world her beauté had efeared, she stood so well in every wichtes grass. This noble queen who was called Dido, who once was the wife of Sicaeus, who was fairer than the bright sun, founded this noble town of Carthage, in which she reigned with such great honor that she was considered the flower of all queens, of nobility, of generosity, of beauty, so that he was fortunate who might once see her. She was of kings and lords so desired that her beauty had set the whole world on fire. So well did she stand in every man's grace. <coughs> so Dido appears here as a really model queen. She's a city founder, outstanding in her nobility and gentle behavior. She's also beautiful, as we might expect, and desired by noble men. But there are a few details about the stock description that give us clues about the nature of her charismatic appeal. And the first is the comparison of Dido to the sun, which might seem like a cliche. Certainly, uh, the poet of the legend compares women to the sun more often throughout the work, um, perhaps almost giving the impression that he's too lazy to come up with fresh uh, descriptions of beauty. But in the context of the legend, the sun imagery is meaningful. So I mentioned in the prologue that there's a god, Cupid, the god of love, appears as a kind of angry, angry god. When he's described, we learn that his golden hair was crowned with a sun instead of gold because of heaviness and weight. And it seemed to me that his face shone so brightly that I could only look at him with great difficulty. This is the poet narrator speaking. So what happens is Dino's sun-like qualities at the textual level, right, at the level of diction, make her resemble the god of love. And by extension, hint that she's in some way unknowable, untouchable, beyond the sensuous ken of regular men. It's a slight Boethian motif. At the same time, the news of her beauty travels, right? She's a public uh, figure. Um, in a way, we might expect almost from a more mediatized word. She kindles the entire world. So in this, in this description, she's accessible through her fame, but she's also out of reach. The other thing is that she's powerful in practical ways. Um, I glossed the word, the Middle English word, freedom is noble liberality. It could also mean royal prerogative uh, or the special rights and privileges uh, claimed by individuals or groups of people. It could also mean freedom of action or free choice. She's a divinely beautiful queen, but she's also someone who acts by choice, who deliberately pursues the object of her desire, in this case Aeneas, and until he betrays her, attains it. Now Chaucer's, or I should say, the legend's heroines are smart, strong, careful planners, tacticians, women who follow their own will, but they are at other times icons of studied artlessness, most appealing when most undone. This is a line, a couple of lines when, uh, that we, where we see Dido as Aeneas leaves her. She kneels, begs him to stay with her, offers to be his servant and his slave. She falls to his feet and swoons there, disheveled with her bright golden hair. And I think what's really interesting is that here in this moment of her sorrow, uh, of her abjection, she resembles the god of love again with this golden hair. Um, if she's previously godlike in her strength, she's now divine in her anguish and in her willingness to lose her freedom. She's willing to be a slave. Um, and while she was previously like Cupid in her unattainability, now it's actually her distress which is indescribable. The narrator says, I cannot write of it, too great a pity I feel to thus indict. 
using these subtle linguistic echoes, the poet makes Dido resemble the god of love when she is an authoritative queen, but also when she's betrayed by her lover. And this is a larger uh, pattern in the legend of, women's, of connecting women's agency to their vulnerability, just as a saint is most powerful, most visibly powerful when being tortured by heathens. And the key point is that this alchemical fusion of strength and vulnerability needs an audience. Saints' passions are typically viewed by crowds of people, and the love woes of the women in the legend have an audience too. The narrator, who is always moved to pity by the sight of fainting queens with golden, disheveled hair. We move to props. In both of these, my first two examples, we've seen a kind of shift um, in charisma. A figure who was powerful, you might, have a, you might say almost a kind of Iberian charisma of strength, um, who shifts because of a trauma or a betrayal into a more complex, vulnerable, I would call it a Rochian type of charisma that fuses, fuses the previous power with, uh, with a radical public vulnerability. Something similar happens in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. This is another poem of the late 14th century, in this case, um, uh, anonymous. But the difference in this tale is that Gawain, the main character of the poem, does not actually desire the charisma that's ascribed to him at the end. So he starts out as a very forceful figure who is in charge of his own image. And by the end of the poem, the image runs away from him. I'll give you a little... Um, a little plot summary. It's really the story of this, um, of this great hero's humbling. He's challenged to decapitate a monstrous green knight at Arthur's court, uh, and as uh, payment for that, he has to present himself a year later to have his own head cut off. In the meantime, he wanders around, winds up at this kind of mysterious fairy-like castle, um, which belongs to Lord Bertilac. Lord Bertilac goes out hunting every day. Lord Bertilac's wife comes to his bedroom and tries to seduce Gawain every single day. Uh, and every day they're supposed to exchange their winnings, so Lord Bertilac gives him the boar or the hind or the fox that he got, and Gawain kisses him in return because he got kisses while he was lying in bed. However, on the final day, um, Bertilac's wife uh, convinces Gawain to take something from her, to accept the gift. It's, uh, it's a green girdle or belt that will keep him safe from the ax stroke that will cut his head off. Uh, well, he doesn't hand this over. He's actually, the deal is he's supposed to hand over everything he wins. He doesn't hand this over. <coughs> Turns out Bertilac was the monstrous figure who had challenged him a year earlier. Um, and he nicks him on the neck to, to mark the fact that he didn't keep his vow, that he didn't keep his promise. Gawain is completely ashamed, returns home, he decides to wear this green girdle as a permanent sign of his shame, of his loss of reputation. Uh, and Arthur's court, which is where the whole adventure began, simply laughs, and they adopt green silk sashes in honor of Gawain and his belt. They say, this is great. Let's all wear green sashes. This is what we're going to do from now on. So at the start of the poem, I'll give you just a few quotations from this. He embodies a charisma of perfection, and he does this in a really overdetermined way. We have about 10 minutes. Well, 10 minutes? Okay, then I will finish with this. The poem makes it clear that he's famous for excellence in all areas. So when he arrives at Bertilac's castle, sorry, all the men in that castle were joyful to appear immediately in his presence at that time. He who possesses all fame and bravery and unblemished morals and who is ever praised. His honor is the greatest before all men on earth. And as the narrator goes on to exp say explicitly, Gawain is exemplary, he's a famous lover, and he's also really invested in presenting himself in this way to the world. And quite quickly, he has this shield with the pentangle <laughs> on it, and the pentangle is described as an endless perfect knot that's meant to symbolize how perfect he is in all of his virtues. So we have his five wits, his five fingers, five virtues, faith in the five wounds of Christ, 
the five joys Mary had in her son. We have sort of social virtues, moral virtues, and it's really over the top. This is what he's showing to the world. On the inside of a shield is a picture of the Virgin Mary, so it suggests already that there's some more complexity to his image, but that part is internal, right? What he shows the world is absolutely exquisite and perfect in every way. It's that Viberian charisma again, right? Someone almost superhuman and certainly free of moral stain. As the poem continues, his image is systematically demolished, right? And it's not just the fact that he breaks the promise. He seems to maybe lie in confession. He goes on a misogynistic rant about how terrible all women are, right? Okay, he kisses his Lord's wife, even though <laughs> he tries not to as much as possible. Uh, so he's basically, his, his entire reputation is destroyed that he's enjoyed up until now with all of these perfect values and, uh, and morals. And when he returns to Camelot wearing the sash, the court reads the object difficultly. The king comforts the knight and all the court laugh aloud about it and affectionately agree that lords and ladies who belong to the table, each man of the brotherhood should have a baldric a band of bright green across his chest, and to wear it in bliss for the sake of that man, for that belonged to the renown of the round table. So they actually understand what he thought was the sign of his shame as something that embodies the renown of the Arthurian round table. And I, what I want to suggest just to close is that even if Gawain can't see it, and I think he can't, he's become a more charismatic figure in his fall than he was when he was perfect. Um, the wound on his neck and the girdle that symbolizes ethical lapse are stigmata and paradoxically they're a way for the court to connect to his humanity. And in making sashes that imitate his belt, they metaphorically touch his body, right? They have something that resembles the object that's touching his, his body. They essentially transform his flaw into a reproducible brand. It's a kind of startlingly modern turn where Gawain is a celebrity whose complex image people can participate in by wearing the right accessory. And what I, what I really love about this is that what you show, what we see when it, once the charisma becomes associated with an object, which we might also think of as being something like a relic um, or a prop or a brand object, is that it's no longer in his control. At that point, We've moved from the object, which was the shield, that represented him to the world the way he wanted to, to an object that carries his charismatic appeal in ways that he may not even approve of. I'll end there. Thank you. between those, those two things. Is the Virgin Mary charismatic? Is Mary Magdalene charismatic? Is Dido charismatic? Charisma, if I understand it correctly, and I, I have some maybe some qualms about the way you understand Weber, but still, if we mm. go to the barbarian thing, charisma is about the ability to command uh, not just respect, but I would say obedience, not through formal means of power. So mm. if you're the king, this is not charisma. If I'm telling you, do, do what I'm saying, mm. this is not charisma. If I am a powerless person, then this might be charisma. All other forms of power are, are very important. Of course, uh, people are, are saints. Is Saint Anthony, is Saint mm. Anthony charismatic? I'm not sure. On the other hand, as I said, we're looking at Abelard, it's, it's, it seems to be the same thing. A, a, I would like to say that Abelard, mm. but everybody hates Abelard, it's easy to hate him. But I mean, I think he was, he was an extremely popular teacher. This, yeah, is, he this is witnessed by his worst enemies. Yeah. I mean, they're saying this, yeah. this, this is not just something he yeah. made up. Is he, in his you know, small academic victories, charismatic? 
he just like he claims he is smarter than others. Is this charisma? I'm not sure. So perhaps we could we could start with a, a, a short explanation also, articulation of that. I'm not. What do you mean by charisma? <laughs> Well, I think, I think you've, you've caught me out in my unwillingness to define it in that kind of a clear way. Uh, I'm, at this point, I'm more interested in seeing what it allows me to see in my texts. Uh, and that's why I deal with it as a collection of qualities, right? Um, and I, I haven't settled on a definition, partly because I, I think the only def... You want to sit down? Yeah, no, 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 I'm good standing. I'm, uh, I had coffee. Um, I think when you try to find the definition of charisma that fits all charismatic types, you, the tendency is to wind up with a sentence that's so vague as to be meaningless. It no longer describes what we would identify as charisma. Something like a strong effect on other people, right? Um, Potts does this, and, it, and he defines it something along those lines. And at that point, you would not actually recognize, um, this is not meant as a criticism of him. He did, you know, it's a great book, but I think at that point it doesn't describe this quality that we think we recognize sometimes. I, I actually, the notion of charisma that I work with does not hold that it always involves power to convince other people to do what you want. I think, in fact, often it's, um, I, I lean more to the fascination part of the, um, of the equation, um, where it's often an, involves an extraordinary effect on other people, um, often emotional, that makes them want to somehow come closer to you. But they may want to come closer to you in order to worship you or imitate you or do what you say. They may also want to come closer to you in order to destroy you. And I think that's also a sign of charisma. But I get that because I'm partly coming at this from modernity. I'm coming at it through celebrity studies. Um, and I would have other examples in, um, I think in medieval texts you often have figures, um, either fictional figures or Marjorie Kemp does this too, Abelard does this too, where they say, the more they hate me, the more this proves how chosen I am, or they, it only increases my fame. There's a sense that hatred is, is in fact as, um, as legitimate a reaction to a charismatic performance as adulation, love, uh, obedience, what have you. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, questions? Well, I, I'm just, uh, so my thinking is very story sized, and I always, uh, and as a specialist in, in Renaissance uh, studies of sanctity, um, I mean, being hated, it, it's, a, it's a topos, it's a Christian topos. You yes. don't have to be charismatic to wish to be persecuted, because that's yep. the uh, essence of, of being a saint. You have to be persecuted to imitate Christ. You, you, can, you, know, you can suffer by being sick. Does that mean that, is that an indication of charisma? I, within the Christian context, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I think it, it's, it's a more culturally... I think it, it's a more culturally specific... Well, let me differentiate between the actual act of being hated persecuted. and persecuted. So this is the manifestation of yeah. the I think what, where I play is at the level of representation. And I think at the moment when you have a text in which either a person is writing about themselves or somebody else is writing about them and very interested in showing how persecuted they were, at that point, you have a strategy that aims at building up a charismatic personality. That's what I would say. So whether the actual person is or isn't, and they may well just understand themselves as following in the footsteps of Christ with no desire to have a particular effect on others, that, that may be the reality. But I think the moment you're looking at a textual level, at a representation, even of a historical figure, that's really, really interested in showing them as being persecuted, I, I would identify that as one strategy that goes to build up a charismatic figure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's a strategy that's also essential to prove sanctity. Yeah. Um, as a culturally specific yeah. ideal. But a, I think a lot of the, um, a lot of what I said, and I, I tried to underscore this a little bit in my talk, so many of these strategies, at least in, in the 
Christian Western European materials I'm dealing with, they're coming out of uh, Christian ideas of, of charisma. That's not, and in fact, I would say even modern stardom has its links to sanctity, um, to this, to the um, proliferation of images of saints, to the way that, I mean, you would know this better than I would, in the 18th century, you have noble women who are commissioned portraits of themselves with a Catherine's wheel or with a symbol, at least in England, right? A symbol associated with a saint. There's a way that you can then take that prop of the charismatic figure and use it as part of your own image, right? So very much so. I think, I think that's just absolutely uh, coming from this dynamic of um, holy figures, uh, of the kinds of relics they leave behind, of the objects which become associated with them, uh, with the, uh, and it makes sense also, this is the reason why a lot of the texts that I'm finding these effects in, or what I think are these effects, are romances. And romance, of course, is a genre that's closely affiliated with hagiography. So I think that's, that's an absolutely close connection of taking these hagiographic motifs and using them for, for other figures. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. Just, just introduce yourself. Please. Well, I'm Linda. Um, I'm from Belgium. Um, I'm from Belgium. I wanted to ask about the, the process of moving away chronologically from the subject that is described. Because um, the charm is something that is usually affected. This is part of the reason why I say I'm actually not trying to prove that individuals were charismatic, right? right? Because I, can't, I actually can't get at that. What I am looking are at medieval representations of various figures. And a lot of, um, for example, with Chaucer, the legendary quasi-historical women, right? But it's a medieval take on them. It tells me about the Middle Ages. It doesn't tell me about Dido, <laughs> right? Um, so I think this is really, I'm looking at, at medieval strategies of representation. Absolutely. Um, I do think Abelard was charismatic. Um, was Dido charismatic? I find this very hard to understand. In what sense was she charismatic? I, I think... Uh, so I, she's a woman, she has blonde hair. She's, she loves, mm -hmm. you know, like this very much. I mean, she's tragic. All these things are true. But this is the, this is the thing that I, I think is really important to say. It's not charisma is it does not actually belong to the person. It's something that's happening in the interchange between people writing about the person, observing the person, even if it's in a fictionalized way. I think Weber was absolutely right on this. It's not you have charisma. You see this. I mean, modern example. Uh, sorry, it, Bill Clinton was widely considered highly charismatic person. Now it's seeping away. It's in, it's in the eyes of the beholders. It's a dynamic that's happening between, uh, between a figure, be they fictional uh, or real, but I'm really focusing on representations, and various kinds of audiences internal to the text. They might be people who are pictured as watching them. It might be the narrator who imagines or depicts himself watching the sorrow of this figure or watching her glory or her beauty. And then, of course, the readers and various audiences outside the text. But I think it's happening in this kind of dynamic. It's not that she has charisma. It's that there's being a... You don't have to convince yeah. me. I wrote a whole book about it. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, please. Such as kings? Such as kings. Secular rulers. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Not so much for me. I think uh, I've, partly because I'm a literature scholar, 
um, and um, and partly because I've been most interested in depictions of um, in complicated depictions of women. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't think there's anything interesting there. It just hasn't been where I've been looking so far. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm, I'm starting to, to find things like that, to find, um, I don't know if, if it's fair yet to say that this is, I'm still thinking about this, so what I'm about to say is very, it's going to be a little bit vague, and for that I apologize. This play on interiority and exteriority in really odd ways um, is something that I'm seeing in a few texts, um, and it seems to me often connected to these kinds of presentations of self. Um, that um, that I find very interesting, and I'm trying to figure out what to do with so far. Um, but certainly, um, there's that. A big question for me, and I just don't know what to think of this yet, are depictions of the maternal body, kind of monstrous depictions of the maternal body, which I think we wouldn't have so much today, but certainly are more interesting in the Middle Ages, um, thinking Melusine, for example. Um, but but certainly this the sense yeah yeah uh, Melusine is this um, legendary figure from um, French stories where she the bottom part of her um, of her body is actually like a mermaid reptile kind of thing and her husband is not supposed to try to see her um, see her nether parts right. Um, she's, oh, sorry, she's on the Starbucks logo. She made it on the Starbucks logo. So actually the Starbucks logo has a, uh, a medieval uh, root. And she's then seen as being somehow the origin of the Counts of Lusignan. So there's a sense of a, of a kind of political originary myth uh, that has to do with a monstrous female, monstrous female genitalia. I don't know. I, I don't know what I, want, what I want to say about that. But I think that's playing... Um, in this dynamic of hit secrecy and revelation, um, in this, in that case, actually also associated to political power and genealogy. So these are areas which I'm, I'm mulling over. Um, one more, though I think we sometimes get this in the modern age too. Um, uh, sometimes you have charismatic performance, or performances I would consider charismatic, um, that, that do strange things to time that shift time, where the figure, um, the way that the figure speaking depicts time um, collapses long periods of time. So the speaker will become suddenly very young and very, and very old again. Heloise does this a little bit in her letters. Uh, Chaucer's Wife of Bath um, has a very complex and rhetorically layered uh, prologue in the Canterbury Tales, where she's sometimes very old and sometimes young and sexually voracious. Uh, so that's another, and Mary of Egypt, the old English life of Mary of Egypt, so now we're back to our saints uh, because the saints are the basis of, of the whole thing. Uh, she also, um, Mary of Egypt was a harlot, a yeah. she's, a she's a loose woman who has sex with absolutely everybody and loves drinking and eating, is converts to Christianity and then tells this kind of sad monk who's chasing her in the desert about all of her previous sins. And in the Old English version of her tale, when she's describing her, her desires and her lusts, there are some mistakes in the Old English, and they actually stretch them until the present day. So in the Latin source, it's clear they were in the past. She's now good. She's praying in the desert, eating her three, you know, a little bit of bread, and she's not struggling with temptation anymore. 
In the Old English translation, she still struggles with temptation. But there are these little shifts in time that I'm pursuing that I think are a really interesting thing that I find in medieval texts. Yeah. That's a very good point, yeah. So, so far I haven't, I've actually been wondering if I can find a nice medieval word, right, that, uh, that will be something close to this. Maybe not exactly, it can't be the same, but. Uh, and so far I haven't found that in the medieval text. So the problem is actually comes a little earlier. It's just, I don't have a good, I can't say, look, this is all the places in my medieval text where this word comes up. So now I can make a list of them and I see exactly what word they're using for, for it. Um, this is why I break it down to, so I, I do use the word charisma in my title and I talk about the history of it, but I'm more interested in breaking, down, breaking it down into these different strategies of representation that elicit fascination and interest. Um, because for me, it's actually not so important at the end of the project to still have the word charisma, right? I'm using the term as a way, and the history of the term, as a way to look for things in texts. But if I don't wind up in a place with that term, I'm fine with that. But it, it seems it gives you so much trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So why do you use it at all? I'll you tell you. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Are irony, uh, mm -hmm. predictions, everything. Why do you need uh, charisma? <laughs> <laughs> I welcome trouble. <laughs> I, think, I think trouble can be productive. Um, I think I've actually, I organized a workshop on this and everybody came in saying, well, I don't really know about this term. But what was interesting was the conversations were very interesting that came out of it because it allows us to talk about different things like the power aspect, right? This ability to, um, to command obedience and the fascination aspect and fame and l lust, though I really want to say that's not the only thing. It allows us to talk about how they might be connected. Yeah. But I, I don't think at this point it's a problem to have trouble. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, rather than the trouble that charisma brings, it's the baggage that it yeah. brings, which is maybe a little different than trouble. I think it, it weighs it down while it does mm -hmm. open it up to certain things. Would you consider it that aspect? Because there are very good other words that you could use that would be as thought-provoking, but just don't have the baggage. And also, I think charisma is so in, in today that his emphasis on reception and success kind of overshadows that term. Mm -hmm. so we purposely did away with the word charisma in the project that we're talking yeah. about. What have you found the most useful terms in your work? Oh, well, I wanted to use different terms, but what, 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 what was what passed with exceptionalism in the sense, but, but to give it sort of very open, we also look at what it would be transgressive. Yeah. Uh, and instead of, and sort of characteristics, sort of types of people, so yes, in, in fame and use, I it's sort of one line of what you did, but I, I wanted to do something that's the most generic that would encompass mm. more things. Yeah. Without the baggage, but also it doesn't look good reception. It's good construction. So mm. It's a different. Right? But I wanted to ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're talking about kings. Uh, women like, um, which is a queen. So you have also the Bridge of Sweden talks about uh, the queen of life of. Uh, do you think? No, I mean. So I mean, she does talk about other women in the secular. Do you look at that? Not yet, but that I think that's actually something 
um, I've done in, the, in a nice little German style uh, organization of my project, I've hired postdocs who tend to wor work more on historical figures so that we, we talk about it and we look at, uh, I had a postdoc who did really interesting work on genealogies and women's genealogies and the ways they're, um, um, they often imagine forms of female lines, right, that are alternative to. Like how they build their own like, family tradition. Yeah. Yeah, or sometimes even just genealogical roles that have, that have uh, unusual placements of women where one wouldn't expect them. Um, but I haven't looked so much at historical queens yet. I think this, the point about the baggage of the term is well taken, and uh, when I started the work, I realized how smart Joe Roach had been in calling his book It. <laughs> he made up his own word. I mean, he didn't make it up. He adopted it from, the, uh, from a much uh, newer tradition, yeah, so it carried less, it carried less baggage. Yeah, yeah, but that's, I think that I'm actually quite open to that. If I could, if I could get, I think when you say exception, exceptionalism, to me that's positively connotated. It could be negative, I agree that it absolutely could be negative, but my instinct is that that tends to be a positive term. Yeah. I agree, I, yeah. I, that was also a problem, I thought, yeah, I, thought, yeah. I like his abnormally interesting people. Yeah. I, I think I want to maintain that, that element of transgression. Yeah. That's really wonderful. So uh, sort of unusual inversions on the trope, on the typical trope. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think this is why, you, while so many of the saints, and I know I'm, I'm standing next to the expert, so, uh, <coughs> so you may wish to correct me, but I do think this is why so many, although so many of the saints, at least at some level, they're pure, right? I think often the audience responses to their images are more complicated. Um, but that's why you do have a figure like Mary Magdalene having such a strong tradition because she plays against the type, right? And I, I do, I think uh, often there is, um, this strange inversions thing comes up with the, with the interiority, exteriority, and with plays on time. There is something about that that's provocative and fascinating in a way that draws uh, attention and elicits strong emotions, right? Which is an important aspect of it, of it for me. Um, so th that, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Hamlut, and um, it's a very interesting uh, topic about charisma to look uh, from very long periods of time. And I didn't understand uh, maybe too much uh, from your presentation. This uh, charismatic uh, personage in uh, this literature work, uh, which kind of uh, social role? 
mm. like more like being a manga or civilizing education, whatever. So that would be more interesting to see the sense of connection between like um, uh, society mm -hmm. and the, the charisma persona itself. That's that's a wonderful question. I think um, I doubt that it would be one. But I do think in certain kinds of texts, um, you have um, certainly my romances, in Middle English romances. I'll just take one genre, right? Because right now I'm still throwing my net wide. In Middle English romances, the charismatic, what I, the, the person who is given charismatic attributes um, often is the, the person through whom society is split apart and then brought back together. Right? But this is kind of, I'm not sure how much that's saying because that's sort of what happens in romances all the time, right? You have families and societies split apart and at the end everything is, um, everything is brought back together. Um, but it, it happens a little bit with, with Gawain, right? Because um, it's a strange court in that, in that narrative. They're all a little bit childish at the beginning. Um, it has weird details, uh, such as when, when this green, big green monster comes into the court and Gawain cuts his head off, the very, very noble knights and ladies of the round table kick the head as it's rolling around on the floor, right? So there are these kind of gruesome details about, that suggest that the court is a little bit off, right? Not quite the noble, glorious, legendary court that we imagine. Um, at the end, he seems to provide them with a kind of opportunity for um, corporate unity, right? They all decide they're going to wear the sash. But I think the, the, because, especially because it's such a complex literary text, it doesn't quite let us be happy about that because he's not happy about it. And it seems to perhaps be a little bit of, of an artificial kind of unity. Right? They've misunderstood this great moral process that he's gone through of recognizing his own fallibility and sinfulness. So, but I think in some cases you do have this kind of this sense of order that's coming through a charismatic person. I'm not sure if I really want to make that as a claim for, I, I don't think I could make a claim for all situations. But in some cases, yes, you do have that kind of function in a larger, in a larger narrative. This is how we become who we are through this person. But only if you promise to be very brief. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just reacting to the last, uh, you're assuming that they don't understand you. I mean, it sounds to me like, well, again, I, have, I yeah. haven't read this story, just what you, the way you're describing it. Could be that they perfectly well yeah. understand him and just being a little bit mean to him because he kind of stuck up and very pure. And they're like, oh, come on. I, I do think uh, the running, um, the thing that's coursing underneath everything I say is an interest in imperfection, right? And certainly in that moment, they are recognizing a kind of imperfection in him and are drawn to it much more than they were to his perfection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.